for good grades. I wish I was better at relationships. I wish I was an artist. I wish I had a better relationship with my wife. I wish for a life full of happiness. I wish I may. I wish I might. Hello. Welcome to Beyond Wishful Thinking. My name is Sherry. Happy Monday. Today we're going to talk about what kind, what parent type you are. But before we get started, please find below, I have curated a booklet that is yours free to download. It's a little sense of what it's like to work with a life coach. So I hope you enjoy that. When you do download the booklet, there will be a little bit more information about me and what I do. And I hope you can enjoy that. So I have, well, first of all, I want to say that um, for those of you who listen to podcasts and maybe think somehow that we that do podcasts are doing something that you couldn't possibly do, let me assure you this has been a morning. My technology has not been working. I apologize ahead of time if that happens again. I may have to just push through in spite of because it seems like it is affecting how I put my thoughts together. So I'm just going to state that right up in the beginning of this podcast. So I have some notes. I have some articles. For those of you who see the YouTube channel where I actually video my podcast, you may see me looking in different directions and that is what's happening. But I also want to bring you as much information as I can. Keeping in mind that this podcast is about perspective. It is about starting conversations. I want people to think out of the box, out of the norms of what they're used to. And in order to do that, I need to bring you lots of information. And so this particular podcast is important to me. And yet there's so much information. I'm concerned that it might be overwhelming. And so I'm going to try and pare it down. And then I likely will just keep talking about this over time. I am noticing on social media, there are a lot of mums and there is a lot of information. Some of it comes from experts. Some of it comes from people like myself who have a lived experience that we want to share. The generation we're currently working in at, with young parents, they have so much information that they're using their social media platforms differently Um, to find that. And we, people who have raised the current generation, we didn't have that information at our fingertips. We did have, uh, of course, people who taught things through the schools and through our doctors and however we got our information in the day. I think that information is so readily available that it can become something that we pick a slice of it and we make a decision and maybe we move forward. And probably that's not a whole lot different than what we did. We would listen to people or we would find a doctor we liked and we would take that information and we would build. Maybe a lot of people don't think about information regarding how they want to parent. And that's something I want to speak about a little bit as well. So when we think about having children, The question is, how much do we think about it? Is it just the next step, what we do after we've been married? This feeling that we want to continue ourselves or we want to finish ourselves somehow. I honestly do not know if I'm being honest how much I thought about children other than I wanted them. Do I know why I wanted them? I don't remember. And I wonder if we need to talk more about that. I do know there are people who have had children that didn't really think they wanted them, but yet felt that they should. And I would certainly like to state that let's let those people be. Let's allow people to make a choice that suits them. And so on that note, I have made some notes. So those of you who are watching me on my Facebook channel, you may find that um, 
I'm glancing down and around and it isn't because I'm chaotic. It's because I'm trying to view my notes. I also am not 100% sure why, but my uh, platform for doing this ha- keeps dying on me today. So I don't know if it's because of where I have my notes. I'm going to move that to a different screen now. So when I was a parent, I felt like I was a strict parent because I had very definite processes of how I thought I wanted to be with my children. I used to look at other parents and think they were kinder or they were, they didn't expect as much. I did have high expectations for my children. However, I believed I wanted my children to be able to live their life differently than I did. And many parents think like that. Sometimes we think if we didn't have enough of uh, material things, we want to provide that for our child. We maybe didn't stop to think about why if we didn't have material goods, did that affect us? What about not having material goods affected us? Because there are people who don't have material goods, who have great children and who are very happy people. So what I want to suggest is that we should have children because we want to build people to be a part of our lives and to maybe become our future because we will move off this earth and we will leave behind people who can continue this world in a way that makes sense. That seems pretty deep when we think I just want to have a child. So some of the thoughts that I had that I put together um, were that no parenting model is perfect. I think we all can agree with that. I believe it's because we are the parents that makes it not perfect. And I say that because human beings aren't perfect. That's the whole point of a human being is to live and learn and grow and become the best version of ourselves that we can be. I think we bring to parenting what's in our vessel or our way of being. So I would often say to people who seemed frustrated by children, remember, they did not ask to be born. I would say to my children, you did not come with a tattooed instruction booklet on your bottom. And so if we join those two things together and we want to have relationship, I think we need to be more curious about what it is we want to offer these beings that we keep bringing into the world. I think in early days, of course, people had children because they needed children to build the world. Once we had mankind or people kind all over, we then would have what we would today refer to as a society. But when did we decide that we needed to start looking at how we created the people who were in effect, society. So I did a little bit of um, looking into that. And it's quite interesting. Actually, there was a book written for parents in 1544 by a man named Thomas Fair is how I'm pronouncing it P-H-A-E-R. And the book was predominantly about nutrition, teething and sleeping. So somewhere way back then, someone decided we need a little bit of help. And those were the things that they wanted help about. And then there's nothing recorded until 1940. And it was Dr. Spock and most of us have heard of him. And so if you think between 1940 and 2023, that's 83 years, we have really only had 83 years of instruction, guidance, discussion, concepts about what is apparent, what should we be doing? Um, I don't know that childhood was what we think of childhood today. Childhood wasn't about developing human beings the way we kind of consider it now. So we all likely have something that we can learn. So one of the things that I kind of think about when I think about parents and children, there's a statement made that we parent the way we were parented. And yet we also say things like, I'm not going to treat my parents in this fashion and whatever that is, whatever it is that your parent did that didn't work well with you, you sort of see your child as the clean slate for you to do better. And that's a good 
thing on some level. But it's not a good thing if that's the reason why that we kind of want. Um, I, I would wonder if we could suggest that if we're not careful, we think we will heal our own hurts by creating a person to become the way we wished we had had. And that isn't the responsibility of our child. And if we bring a child into the earth to have something that we missed, it feels to me like that's a lot to put on your child. So I'm just going to refer to my notes that I, I did here. Um, I wanted my children to be able to, if they made mistakes, which they were going to, I wanted them to be able to have tools to sort through, to choose, to use when they made mistakes or before they made the mistake. And in order to do that, we had to be super open and aware of what were values, what were good things to be. And, and it can't be simply what I wished for myself. I'm just going to, so the problem is if we are not careful, um, we want to our children to be something that reflects us and what we really should want for them is to be themselves and to learn how to do that. So I see a trend in every generation. Um, yeah, I've referred to that already about how we want what we didn't have. So the four types of parenting that I came across in three different fashions are permissive, authoritative, neglectful, and authoritarian. And that is from, let me just pull down my screens here. That was from a lady by the name of Diane. Oh dear. I can't find it now. Diana Baumrind. And it was done with researchers from Stanford, Eleanor McCobby and John Martin. And so their article about the four types of parenting are those permissive, authoritative, neglectful and authoritarian. So I'm just going to read through the little points of what they are. So permissive is child driven, rarely gives or enforces rules, overindulges the child to avoid conflict. So the permissive parent, the common traits are high responsiveness, low demandingness, they communicate openly and usually let their children decide for themselves rather than giving direction. The rules and expectations are either not set or they're rarely enforced. Typically, they go through great lengths to keep their kids happy, sometimes at their own expense, at the expense of the parent. Permissive parents are more likely to take a friendship role than a parenting role. They prefer to avoid conflict and they will often acquiesce to their children's pleas at the first sign of distress. These parents mostly allow their kids to do what they want and offer limited guidance or direction. The authoritative parent, and I found this interesting, authoritative is different than authoritarian. So just kind of remember that when I read through them. The authoritative parent has a high responsiveness and a high demandingness. So the permissive parent was high responsiveness and low demandingness. So a permissive parent may have felt that they didn't want a lot of demands put on them. And so now they're going to do that for their child. The authoritative parent has both high responsiveness, high demandingness. They set clear rules and expectations for their kids while practicing flexibility and understanding. They communicate frequently. They listen to and take into consideration their child's thoughts, feelings, and opinions. They allow natural consequences to occur. Kids fail a quiz when they didn't study, but uses the opportunity to help their kid reflect and learn. Authoritative parents are nurturing, supportive, and often in tune with their children's needs they guide their children through open, honest discussion to teach value and reasoning. Kids who have authoritative parents tend to be self-disciplined and can think for themselves. The neglectful parent has low responsiveness and low demandingness. 
They let their kids fend for themselves, perhaps because they're indifferent to their needs or uninvolved or overwhelmed with other things. Other, uh, they offer little nurture, little guidance, and little attention. They often struggle with their own self-esteem issues and they have a hard time forming close relationships. So sometimes referred to as uninvolved parenting, the neglectful parent style is exemplified by an overall sense of indifference. Neglectful parents have limited engagement with their children and they rarely implement rules. They can also be seen as cold and uncaring, but not always intentionally as they are often struggling with their own issue. So an, a neglectful parent could be one of these parents that I talked about where they didn't have time to heal themselves and now they have another individual and that individual has their own separate needs and now they need something from this parent and this parent can't provide that. Now this is the authoritarian parent, the one that I referred to that's different than the um, authoritative Okay, so authoritarian parent, they are high demand, but low response. So the other one was high demand and high response. The authoritarian parent has a high demand and a low responsiveness. They enforce strict rules with little consideration of their kids' feelings or social, emotional, and behavioral needs. So it doesn't bother these parents what the child needs. They often say, because I said so, when their kids question the reason behind a rule or a consequence. Communication is mostly one way from the parent to the child. This rigid parenting style uses stern discipline, often justified as tough love, in an attempt to be in full control Authoritarian parents often talk to their children about wanting, without wanting input or feedback. So when I said I was a strict parent, I believe I am a authoritative parent. The difference being that strict parenting doesn't necessarily mean rigid, my way or the highway, that idea. So that that is four styles of parenting that I thought was interesting. And I'm it also says that sometimes one parent might take something from another style. So for example, the, um, let me see if I can find it here. The parent who is more strict may also be able to change that. So the most successful parents know when to change their style depending on the situation. So an authoritative parent may want to become more permissive when a child is ill by continuing to provide warmth and letting go of some of their control. So you can have ice cream for lunch and dinner. But a permissive parent may be more strict if a child's safety is at stake. Like when crossing a busy street, they may say, you're going to hold my hand whether you want to or not. So obviously we have bits and pieces of all of it and it's going to adjust accordingly. So that's one one style. The other thing I came across that I thought was really interesting. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to go back to my notes first. So the other people that I really enjoy, I think I mentioned her already, but I've done a couple different podcasts because of my technology this morning. Barbara Coloroso, her theories around parenting types are brick wall, jellyfish and backbone. So a brick wall parent is rigid. And often after they have all this rigidity, they become jellyfish when they can't keep that up anymore. So then there's the flip-flop that isn't great for kids. A jellyfish is just as you, you imagine, no structure, anything goes. And the backbone has, has an ability for form, but it can also bend. And so that's a little bit similar to the authoritative versus authoritarian. So brick wall would be authoritarian, backbone would be authoritative, and jellyfish would be permissive. So you can see where the styles are similar, but it's just how people teach about them. And then attachment style parenting is also something that's big right now. It's, um, I think it's really interesting. The idea that we want, to, oh, uh, something Barbara Coloroso says is we want to teach our children how to think, not what to think. So if you're wanting your child to be thankful, then you need to show them how to be thankful. 
you need to be able to say things like, um, thank you. Uh, I'm so grateful for this. And they hear that. And then they want that for themselves instead of it being about what you command them to be. So attachment parenting, where that, where that word helps us and and how we think about parenting is if you don't model and teach and form and build this little individual and they're not attached to you because that's how they will become attached because you're a life source to them. You're the person um, that gives them life. And so when they need something, they'll refer back to their life source. So attachment parenting is a bit like that. And if you don't have attachment parenting and there isn't a connection, then your child will just attach to the next thing that feeds them. So if you have a 14 year old that's struggling because he's getting all of his life information from other 14 year olds, then you might want to take a look at how can I reattach my child? Maybe we drop the ball a bit and we need to pick that up. And I know um, a social worker that uses this theory and his recommendation is to go away for a couple of weeks with your child with no cell phones, no outside world, and just reconnect and help the child remember that you are their life source. Because the good news about parenting is sometimes we drop the ball. Dan Siegel talks about um, the four S's of attachment, and that is safe, soothing, seen and secure. So it's easy to drop the ball sometimes. Um, the other person that I really appreciated um, had a statistic was that, uh, oh, it's uh, Ed Tronic. 30% is the amount of time that most parents have good connection with their kids. So it could seem like that's not possible to have a good relationship. But the 70% that we don't always get right, as long as we repair any rupture in the relationship, the relationship will be solid and secure. So the good news is you don't have to get it right all the time. But what I want you to understand is what type are you? Um, are you going to be? So it can seem like um, you want to give your kid free reign and it's a lot of work. So I often used to say to people, it's a lot of work to parent. And it can be. And I think where the work comes in is it isn't in providing for them. It isn't in all of those other things. I mean, those things are work. It's in doing the parenting, even when you're tired, it's doing the thing that's hard to do for you. So some skill you want your child to have if they're struggling getting it, or if it's, if, if it means you have to go without sleep or maybe go without entertainment or go without something to teach your child that that's where it's hard. That's the part nobody talks about the, the idea that I am tired. I've been up all night with my child and my other child needs something or both children need something or all the children, however many you have, I have to persevere through my tiredness. I can be real with my child. I can say, I am tired and I need you to do this for me because I'm tired. It's okay for your child to learn these things because that's the modeling that they're going to need. If we raise children to believe that we are perfect human beings and that we've got everything figured out, it's devastating for children to learn that that isn't what it's all about. So another thing that I came across that I really liked is a psychotherapist who has decided that these are the seven things that most mentally strong kids can do or say. And this is by, um, I'm trying to figure out where I got this article. I don't know if it's a psychotherapist, um, Karen Hayes. One of the most common questions parents ask is what are the key strengths I could be teaching my child? So the seven that they came up with were, empowering themselves. If your kid says my friend got a higher score on the quiz, which makes me feel bad about me, they're essentially giving someone else power over them. Work with your kids to come up with phrases that they can repeat to themselves. Use words that show that they're in charge of how they think, feel, and behave, regardless of how everyone around them are thinking and feeling and behaving. So, 
all I can do is my best, act confident, I am good enough, I choose to be happy today. The next step that makes strong, mentally capable children, they adopt to change. Whether it's moving to a new school, not being able to play with friends during the pandemic, change is tough. Your kid might miss the way things used to be or worry about what's happening that might make their life worse. But mentally strong kids understand the change can help them grow. So we need to name our, their emotions and our emotions. Emotions are a big thing we don't talk enough about. Change is uncomfortable, but putting a name to your feeling can lessen the sting of the emotion. Most of us adults don't spend enough time thinking about how we feel. In fact, we tend to put more energy into fighting our emotions. So when your kids faced with a major change, have them talk elaborately about how they're feeling. More importantly, help them find and define the right words to describe it which I think now most people have seen all the charts and we talk about our child about what's happy like, what's sad look like, but that's where we have to keep moving forward. We want to teach them when to say no. So everyone struggles to speak up, to say no, to express their feelings, but we need to teach our children how to do that. And here is a test you can give your child. It's called the give up test. And I really liked this. When your kid is faced with a decision to say yes or no, ask them what will they have to give up if they say yes. For example, saying yes to go playing with a friend at the friend's house might mean giving up time with grandma. Ask them, are you willing to give that thing up? If they decide they don't want to, then say no. If they decide they don't mind, then they can go ahead and say yes. Help them find courage to say no by coming up with polite ways to turn people down. Give them the words. If we as adults don't have the words and we don't even know how to say no, our kids aren't going to know how to say no. So no, I'm not able to. You don't always have to give a reason. Thank you so much for inviting me, but I have other plans. I'll have to check and get back to you. This gives them time to make up their mind without being pressured. I don't really feel like doing that today, but I appreciate you asking. I know what I've said in the past is please ask me again. Give an invitation back to them that you want, you want their invitation. We want our children to own their own mistakes. They're often tempted to hide their mistake because they don't want to get in trouble. Maybe they forgot to do their homework or they broke something. Owning your mistake gives you character. Kids who are brave enough to practice this, they recognize what they did wrong and they mentally prepare themselves to fully admit to what they did. Adults have a hard time with that. I know I would have a hard time with that on some level, I, I believe. <clears throat> they also apologize and they find ways to avoid making the same mistake again. Mistakes are not bad. And we hear all that cliche talk but I don't know if we instill that for our children. We want to create an environment for success. So if your kid is disorganized, they probably have a hard time remembering all their assignments. If their room is filled with tons of treats, they might not be able to resist eating too much sugar. So we, that's creating the environment, right? They celebrate other people's successes. And this is something that's really big. I think somehow we've missed as a society um, how to teach that versus competing. It's normal for kids to feel jealous when their friends get a new toy, um, when the other team wins the game. Feeling negatively towards other people only hurts your child. It doesn't hurt the other person. Encourage your, ch your children to cheer people on. Mentally strong kids are supportive of their peers and they focus on performing their best without worrying about how everyone else is doing. Act like the person you want to be. Have your kid come up with a list of traits they admire. Maybe they want to be more confident like their sister or optimistic like their teacher. Encourage them to act as if they already possess those traits. And, and also I would think um, congratulate them on seeing it. Being aware, that's self-awareness. If I look at somebody and say, wow, I wish I could smile under pressure like that person, 
then maybe I could remember that the next time I'm under pressure. But if I don't even know I like that, I, I can't even practice it. So helping them have this discussion is what's going to give them the traits. They fail and they try again. Failure hurts. It can be embarrassing, disappointing, and frustrating. Talk about that. It's okay to feel those feelings. But then the most accomplished people, they reach their, their goals by trying again. Okay. And then they persist. Number seven, when it takes a while to reach a goal or when you don't feel like putting in the hard work to succeed, your brain might try to convince you to give up. Mentally strong kids will persist and they will continue to work hard even when they don't feel like it. So one of the exercises they gave here, which I was big on trying to do neat little things with my kids, it somehow made them remember. Have your kid write a letter filled with words of kindness and encouragement to themselves. So I just did an exercise in a summit, actually, where they asked us to write a letter to someone we had met in the summit as though that person had reached out and was struggling. And then at the end of it, it was really a letter to ourselves because what we would say to someone else, we need to say to ourselves. And so if we get our kids started on that, they have a better idea. The other thing that I thought was interesting is I looked up the definition for self-esteem and self-confidence. And I think we use them interchangeably a bit. And I want people to think differently of them because you can have one without the other. So self-esteem is how we value and perceive ourselves. It's based on our opinion and belief about ourselves. But self-confidence is an attitude that we have about our skill and our ability. It means that we accept and trust ourself in the ability to do something. So we could have self-confidence, but not self-esteem that we have value. So I might think that I am a good speaker, but I don't have enough esteem to do it. So we want to kind of make sure that we teach both sides of that to our children. I think we sometimes get caught up in teaching them what they can do and then wonder why they don't, but maybe they don't feel capable. They don't feel like they're able to do that. And so that's another thing that we, we could work on for our kids. Um, there's another article I came across from a lady, uh, Esther Wojcicki. Um, she is a person who raised successful CEOs, which I struggle with wanting to put this forward as where we want to go because I think we live in a society where our success is measured by how much we've done. And I would rather have a society where our success is measured by how we feel because that's what's going to allow us to do more. So in essence, I suppose that's what this is. But I, I did like the, the, the things that she believed are what helped her children become where they what they became. So teach your kids to care. So this person believed that um, they grew up believing it was their duty to contribute and make community better. Um, the importance of community. She's claiming here too that Americans have it all wrong. So I like to say North Americans because we're in Canada. So um, we're part of that whole concept, even though our countries are slightly different. That kids grow up feeling like they're the center of the universe. As young adults, they're not only lacking grit and independence, but they're wholly unprepared to take on causes that could make the world a better place. And I think that that is something that we need to consider um, as a result of how we have been raising our children lately. And we want them to prioritize service and purpose. Um, and so the concept on that one was what, why do you think uh, we have an epidemic of opioid addiction, depression, and suicide? We don't seem to have the right information about how to live well, how to take care of ourselves and others. And I would agree that there is a lot of that. But I think a lot of that comes from the inability to know who we are and to live to our rules. And we need as parents to put in our children the ability to understand how they can be in a world where, um, so permissive parents who think that they don't want rules for their kids. Once their children are into a typical environment, there are rules. And so then how are they going to combat that? How are they going to understand? So we need a, we need a structure around our children. 
And we need to teach our children about other people's perceptions. Um, I know that for myself, when we would take our children out, I can remember times that we would walk into a restaurant. We had three children. They were about two years apart, two and a bit. And I would see the looks on people's faces. Why are they bringing their children into this restaurant? I came here to relax. This is a nicer restaurant. Take your child to McDonald's maybe. Um, we took our children into a jewelry store one time and the look on the jeweler's faces was like, why would they bring these children in here? We wanted to buy clock for our home and um, we were buying it through a jeweler. But I went prepared. I took bags. I explained to my children where we were going. I sat them down and gave them something to do. Um, they admitted to us after they said, when you walked in here, we thought you were pretty silly to bring that many children, but they learned that our children were behaved. I had numerous people say, thank you so much for bringing your children in a well-behaved manner to this establishment. But I would say to my kids, if they got a little bit loud, do you see that lady over there? She might be deciding that she needed a break from her kids tonight and she's at this restaurant to enjoy the company she's with and so we need to respect that we need to sit quiet you know how to do that would you like something different to do if you're bored bring out a coloring book bring out whatever it is you do as a parent so it's teaching community it's teaching about everything else around that child too not just the child um, the other article I came across I really enjoyed is um, five phrases that parents should never say to their kids. And I thankfully just, I hear things and I try to. So where I did my parenting was, I know what I didn't like as a child. So instead of saying, that's it, my kids are going to be given everything or I'm going to take away things that I didn't like, I wanted to change the dynamic. And so... I would hear things and I was mature enough to say, I don't like that. How could that be different? I'm not perfect. And I made mistakes. I one time was on my hands and knees on the floor, pounding the floor beside me because I was so frustrated about a child and what they were doing. And I didn't know how to combat how I felt in the moment. And then I felt fearful that I was going to be an abusive parent because my biological family had been abusive. But my husband in, shared with me, from his observation that I removed myself from the situation. I allowed my anger out. I then spoke to my child about what I had done and there was a plan around the whole situation and there was a discussion and there was a hug and forgiveness and all of that. So that's where the work comes in is being willing to see myself as an adult that makes mistakes and share that with my child. And so um, I heard myself. So one of the ones that they bring is, um, they say here is I have to go to the store. We attended church and I would say to the kids, come on, come on, hurry up. Let's go. We have to go to church. And I remember sitting down and talking with my husband at the time and saying, Hey, we have to change that. And my husband was more than willing to try and work with what I felt because I had such high ideals. Um, and this one really bothered him. He was like, seriously, words don't mean that much. He didn't believe that. I think he's changed his mind on that. But I said to him, I believe if I say I have to do something, they're going to hear it as I don't want to do it. And I want them to know the things I want to do. And so this article says the same thing. Whenever you say that you have to do something, whether it's running an errand or going to dinner at grandma's house, you imply that you're being forced to do things you don't want to do. And so we've had those situations. Our family sometimes wants us to be places we don't want to be because we're tired, because we feel like we don't have the time, whatever our reason is, but then we go. And so we're teaching our children that we do things we don't want to do. And so we're better to say, and she had a great example here. Um, Kids who grow up to be successful understand that life is about the choices that you make. You can teach them the important lesson by saying something like, I am tired, but we told grandma we'd go to her house and I want to make sure I keep my word. Or 
there was another example of we go because we love grandma, even though we're tired. The one about I, I, um, there was another one here. I have to go grocery shopping. And so you say, I don't feel like grocery shopping today, but I want to make sure we have food in the fridge for the week. So it's okay to show our humanness. And I wonder if sometimes as parents, we think we shouldn't, but we should. I remember saying to my children, sometimes mommy's brain is tired and we all need a quiet moment. And we'd be driving down the car road and I just too much chatter. And they learned that. I said that from a young age and I felt selfish at times, but I learned after the fact that I was open and honest and willing to allow them to be who they were. But I also had to be who I was and we had to find that mesh. And I made mistakes and you're going to make mistakes. But if we can make them from a place of honesty, we'll have a better shot at this game of parenting. And my son, when I remarried, my husband took my son somewhere and probably was overcompensating. And my son said, I think my brain is tired right now. I'd like to stop talking. I, we laughed about that, but at least he had the skill to say, I need a space from you. So that's what we want to do as parents. The other thing we should not say is I hate my job. Let's say you had an exhausting day at work and you just want to go home and vent to your partner. It might seem harmless because you weren't even speaking directly to your children. But keep in mind that they pick up all of the messaging. So you're better to express what's going on in an honest fashion. Um, the other one is everything will be okay. If your kids didn't get picked as a starting player for their sports team, convincing them that everything will turn out well doesn't prepare them for the future. Rather than telling them that there's always a happy ending, teach them that they're strong enough to handle. So one of the things that Barbara Coloroso says that I love is there is no problem so great we can't solve it. We might not fix it, but we can solve the reaction we have. We can solve what it did to us. We There's so much scope in that statement, and I love that. Rather than telling them there's always a happy ending, teach them they're strong enough to handle life's curveballs. Um, the other one is you make me so mad. So as parents, it's important to stay calm and resist the urge to blame our kids or anyone else really for our emotion. Instead of acting out of rage over something your kid did, a healthier response would be, I don't like it when you do that. And then explain why. And then they can understand the dynamics of who we are. Just recently, I have started to hear myself say something to this effect. Well, so, so the example I had just recently is I have been in a lot of car accidents and our roads have been slippery and my husband drives differently than I do on slippery roads. So I said to him just recently, I trust your driving. I don't trust other people's driving. And I'm fearful because I've been in accidents. So I don't know how to deal with my feelings about that. When I ask you to slow down or to act differently in the car, it's about me, not you. And that made all the difference. It doesn't uh, stop me from expressing my fear so that I don't end up doing something different, like lashing out because I'm afraid. So. All of these things that I'm trying to bring to your awareness are just ways of being. Don't decide that because you didn't get something or you didn't want something, or as a parent, that because you brought this child into the world, you dominate. We could start having better communication, better relationships. And um, if you don't want to do something as a parent, don't diffuse it by making a rule that um, I'm not giving my child something simply because they don't need it or be honest with yourself and say, I don't have the strength right now. I don't have what I need. Maybe I need to reach out for help to learn how to do that. So all of the social media posts that are out there kind of forgiving people all of the stress that they feel around parenting, on some level, that's good. On some level, though, Use those platforms to ask questions about why do I feel this way and research multiple concepts around it and then decide what is it you want for your child because you're developing a human being. 
um, again, I've had some tech issues. And so I don't know if I said this in a podcast that's not being published. But when I was a stay at home mom, I worked some evening jobs and some creative jobs in order to be able to be home. We always tried to have one parent at home. But I sometimes felt very frustrated being stuck at home as I felt at the time. It was a decision I made, but it also was a difficult decision. And so I would feel like I hadn't accomplished anything some days and my husband would come home and there was a bit of envy or, um, you know, the, the willingness to believe that he had it better than I did because he was free to make choices. And yet I chose to have these children. So we want to be careful how we do that, that we're in it together. We made choices. We need to stick by the choices we made. If the choices aren't working, then let's find some other things that will help us with that, but let's not punish or, um, change the dynamics because of things that we aren't figuring out within our own bodies. And he would often say to me, which I am eternally grateful for, he would say, you're building people. I didn't always like it at the time because I felt like it was maybe like uh, he didn't know what to say. So he'd say something like that. But when I stop and think about it, that is exactly what we are doing and what people do you want to build. They shouldn't be replicas of us because we are evolving as a human dynamic, as a human race. And we want to learn about how to give them what they need, not what we think we wish we had. We want to give them things that we may be so grateful they have. Even So another example of that is I have a child who sometimes adults found very difficult to be around because he was capable of being who he was. He was just luckily born with that gene in him. He would say things like, well, that's how I do it. If we tried to make him be more compliant with society. And these weren't issues that mattered. Things like about how to say a word. We would say, you know, if you said that this way, people would understand you more. And he would say, well, that's how I say it. And there's a certain level of that that we all need. And um, I feel like adults struggled with being around him because it made them uncomfortable. They felt that they couldn't be what he was. So therefore they needed to shut that down. And I want that to be something we think about with our kids, that they are going to embarrass us and they are going to be different than us. And we don't need to cut that off if it's healthy. Um, and we need to teach them about their environment and about community and about all of the things that they need so that they can be the best individual they can be. Because the, the sad reality is we're going to move on and they're going to be left figuring out who they are if we haven't helped them do that while we're here. So the greatest gift we can give our children is to step out of their way but not in a way where there's no rules, no guidance, no thinking, no judgment, because they are going to have all of that done to them. And we need to teach them how to have self-esteem and self-confidence. So they need to know that they're worthy and they need to know that they have the skills that they need to live in this world, because not everybody they're going to rub up against, not everybody they're going to be hired by are going to have the skills that we hope to give them. And so they need them because if we don't give them to them, they're going to struggle just like we might have, or maybe we are. So I hope this helps. It feels very rambly. It was a tough technical morning. So I apologize. Um, I may even by the looks of this video, not be able to put the YouTube channel up. I will maybe put a video and a audio there. We'll see how that goes when I'm actually posting. Have a great Monday, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. As much as I enjoy discussions, I also want to provide a service to people who would like more. If you want to do more than listen, get in touch with me with the links in the description. You can also email me through hello at beyondwishfulthinking.ca. And I'd like to give you content you enjoy, so please leave a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. If you're watching through my YouTube channel, leave your comments below. If you want more of Beyond Wishful Thinking podcasts, make sure to subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you are listening right now.